Well, thank you, Victoria, for the introduction, and welcome to the last talk of tonight. So you heard already a few facts about the brain, and it might have given you an idea how complex this organ is in our body. So with the spinal cord, it actually controls all, all our movements, it defines who we are, how we are thinking, and when we think about cell types, you already heard that they are the neurons. And they are actually doing the functional job. So they can receive information, they can process it via electrical signal, and they can pass on this information again to other neurons. But neurons are not the only cell types, as you might have heard of from the last question. So for a long time, we thought that for a healthy brain, for not diseases, we thought that the neurons are the most important cell types. But this is not true. There are many other different cell types that we now know that they are very important, that we have a healthy and functional brain. And today I will talk about the immune system. Many of you might be surprised that we actually have a special immune system in the brain. And it is executed by these little cells that we call microglia. But before I go into more detail of this special part of the immune system, I will give you an overview of our general immune system. So it is divided into two parts. There is the innate immune system that we already have when we are born. It is very unspecific and it is performed by the innate immune system cells where also our microglia are part of. And then we have the adaptive immune system. And this is very specific to pathogens, so for example to viruses, to bacteria, but also to some fungi. And it is performed by specific cells, which are our white blood cells. And why does our brain now have its own immune system? Because we have, for the rest of the body, we already have an immune system. Why does it need a special one? And this is because the brain is physically disconnected from our rest of the body. So when we take a closer look at the brain, we see that blood vessels are also growing to the brain, so they could supply their immune system. But when we take an even closer look, we see that every blood vessel is surrounded by special cells. So they are blocking the immune system or the blood cells from the body to the brain, which we call this blood-brain barrier. And there are some restrictions, like who gets in the club and who does not. So there are stuff that can get into our brain through this barrier. So for example, oxygen, but also CO2 can get in, but also nutrients like sugar and hormones can pass into our brain, but also some um, toxins like ethanol, which some of you might have now taken up in the brain, um, can also pass into the, in the brain. But the main reason why we have this barrier is to keep out infections. So, for example, pathogens like bacteria and viruses, they are not able to pass into a brain, and this is the reason why our brain is very protected. And even though the peripheral blood cells, so from our bloodstream, they could help with infections in the brain, but they are also blocked. And this is why we need our special immune system in the brain. And these cells are the microglia, as I already told you. They have very small cell bodies, and they have very long and branching processes. And with these processes, they can like, sense their uh, environment, they can see if there are any pathogens, if there are any changes. And when there are proteins or dead cells accumulating in their brain, they are, tr um, they are taking up the trash. So they have a a process which is called phagocytosis, so they can surround dead cells with their processes, they then take them up and then they just take out the trash. But when there are now some infections, these resting microglia, they get into an activated status. So they retract their processes and they get in a more bigger, rounder shape, and they can release then proteins that also attract other immune cells, like the T cells, and then they can also eliminate these pathogens from our brain, also again with the phagocytosis process. But what is when this balance system of the immune system in the brain gets in a disbalance? And this is when, for example, this phagocytosis, so taking up proteins or dead cells is impaired, or that we have a chronic release of these inflammatory signals, then we get 
a very like a disease state and then also neurons can be affected and they die. And this is the case in, for example, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson and also multiple sclerosis. So all in these diseases, the neurons are dying. And what I'm now looking at in my project, in my PhD, is how we can find this neuron and microglia interaction. So we think that maybe the loss of the neurons is just a side effect, that the microglia are maybe the disease-causing cell types. So how can we do this in the lab? So we could take some brains, but we already know that there are better options. So we tried to make this brain organoid, as we ho already heard, and I hope I'm not going to prison for working with them. And then we also need this microglia, so the immune cells. And we know that in the human development, the brain is developing in an area which will turn out into a head. But I told you that the microglia are immune cells, so that they are coming from a different field. They are developing from this yolk sac, where all our blood cells are coming from. And during development, these microglia then need to migrate from this yolk sac to the brain, to the neurons, and there protect the neurons from any infections. And so what we would like to do in the lab is to take both parts, so the brain and the microglia, and put them together in a dish. And you already heard about the cool pluripotent stem cells. So that's also what I'm working with. So we take the skin cells, cultivate them in a dish, and we add these pluripotency factors, which you already heard is the reprogramming. And then we have these stem cells that are pluripotent, which means that they can develop in different cell types. And in my case, so I work with microglia, which are part of the blood cells, and I work with neurons. So we take now these pluripotent stem cells. Here is how they look in a dish. They are growing in small colonies. And to generate then the organoids, we dissociate them into single cells. And these single cells aggregate into balls, which we call the embryo bodies, because they are resembling a stage of embryonic development. And then we can put them in a sort of jelly, like a hydrogel, and they can grow bigger. And then you see that they are already like a few millimeters in diameter. So now we also need the microglia, so the blood cells. And therefore, we take again the stem cells, but we push them in a more blood, um, blood lineage. So we generate these hematopoietic progenitors, which means the early stages of blood cells. And from these cells, we can then generate this microglia. And as you can see, also in our lab, they really like to form these long branching processes. So they look, for us, very healthy. And when we then put those two types together, we see marked here in red, the, the microglia, that they are actually uh, able to migrate into the organoid. So they are also doing the same in our lab as they are doing in the embryonic development. So now that we have our model system, what, what can we do with it? And I told you that we are uh, looking at neurodegenerative diseases, so uh, diseases where the neurons are dying. And I will give you an example about Alzheimer's disease because it is the most common neurodegenerative disease. And the usual onset of disease in, is in later age, so over 65. But the problem is that this disease is is um, irreversible. So there is no cure. You can only treat, with, uh, treat the symptoms and to try to slow down the disease progression, but at the moment there is no cure. The symptoms of the patients are in general dementia, so the people tr um, forget very easily um, like things that they should remember. They also don't recognize their family or friends. And in the end, they also have very strong difficulties just to perform daily tasks. And when we look at the brain, we see compared to a healthy brain, the, the uh, brain of an Alzheimer's patient is much smaller and it just looks like shrinking. And this is because neurons are dying and these neurons are dying in specific regions that are also necessary for the memory. And for Alzheimer's disease, they have been shown to be different causes. So on the one side, it can be genetically, but these are only 1% to 5% of the patients. Then they also can accumulate certain proteins in the brain that then disturb the normal function. There are also risk factors like normal aging or brain injury. 
And since a few years now, um, the neuroscientists are also looking at other cell types that are the microglia, and this could mean that also infections and this chronic inflammation could least lead to the severe diseases. So when we take a look at this microglia now in Alzheimer's brain, we see that in early stages this microglia have very long processes, so they are still have a, a healthy uh, morphology. But in the late stage of, er of Alzheimer's, then they get these round shapes, which means they are activated, they are reacting to some infection or some um, problems in the brain, and they cannot really function anymore. But however, so until now, there's not a, like a, a cure or a specific answer why this mi microglia look like this. So there are still a lot of questions how the microglia are reacting to the protein aggregates and how this in the end leads to the death of the neurons. So now that we have our system, we could actually look this more into detail in our lab. And we can take pa uh, patient samples and to compare it to, uh, to healthy individuals. And first we can look at genetic risk variants. So we can see if there are specific um, genetic factors that are causing specific diseases. But we can also look now at neuroinflammation because we can now also look at the in immune system of the brain. And we can also test environmental factors or toxins, which effect they might have on the diseases. And in hopefully in the future, we could also test new therapeutic drugs. And I hope that I could show you today with my talk that we don't know, like, we have a lot of questions open, and that we should not only look at the neurons, but also at the immune system, and that a healthy immune system also means that we have a healthy brain. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Let's see what kind of questions people have. And who is ready to ask a question? I think there is one on the back, very back. Just wait a second. Okay. Hi, thanks a lot for the presentation. I just have one short question. How to recognize a neuroinflammation? What kind of symptoms are there? Sorry, could you speak up a little bit? Oh, okay. Thanks a lot for the presentation. I just have a very simple question. So, how to recognize uh, neural inflammation? Like, what symptoms does it have? So, the question was how we can recognize the inflammation. So, I told you that the microglia can actually have different shapes. So, this is one that we look at the morphology, but we can also see which proteins are they releasing. So, they are sending out signals that are signaling, inf hey, there is an inflammation, we need to react. So, they are also trying to communicate this inflammation to other cells to react. And there is a question just next to this previous question. Person. Thank you for the talk. Um, I have a question. So you said um, if the microglia has been activated by, let's say, a beta, for example, um, is it possible to block these pathways that activate then the, the, the microglia and maybe then use it as a therapeutic approach? Yeah, so there you can also like activate the microglia, but we can also give them signals that they should be more in a healthy way or to block specific pathways that they need to be this activated. So if we actually know that the microglia are the disease causing, um, like the disease causing cell type and that the inflammation is, is one of the disease um, phenotypes, then we could try to block this inflammation. So for now, there is no drug or anything So there are that has other drugs for um, immune or autoimmune um, disorders, but not at the moment for neurodegenerative diseases. Thank you. Is there, yes, there is one question here, Vicky. Oh, there was two questions, apparently. <laughs> uh, so thank you for the talk. Um, there is the hypothesis that also depression or other psychiatric disorders are caused by inflammation in the brain. And I mean, like, it seems like a lot of diseases are, um, are leading back to inflammation. And um, I wonder how 
this inflammation differs that it leads to so many different diseases at the end, or so, does so it, it any differ? I don't know. So there might be some difference just in the, the area of the brain where the inflammation would be. So for example, in the hippocampus and the cortex, that it is in the Alzheimer's that we get like this disease. But if we, for example, look at the, the Parkinson's disease where the midbrain is affected, so this might be a reason why we get also different diseases. Okay, there's one question, one more here. Thank you, interesting talk. Um, how do you make the distinction that a disease is of genetic um, origin and not caused by external factors? Okay, so the, the patients are seen by clinicians, which is not my part, but when they are getting to the clinic then, and they get the diagnosis of, for example, Alzheimer's disease, you can test their DNA, so you take a sample of the patient and you can screen for already known mutations that can cause this disease. And when you see that there is no change in these genes, then you, you assume that is, it is not a genetic cause. Or also if you have um, like also other people in your family that also have this disease, then you can assume that it, it is caused by genetic factors. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see if there is one more question, which will be last here in the middle. Um, you mentioned at the beginning that um, the immune system of the brain is separated from the immune system of the rest of the body. So what's the reason for that? So the idea is that the brain is so important when it, it does not function properly that our complete body shuts down. So it has its own protection with this blood-brain barrier to keep out uh, viruses or, or bacteria that cannot infect then the brain. Okay, thank you very much, Johanna.